Um, my name is Holly Cannon, and I'm the president of the International Women For Women's Forum's Leadership Foundation Board of Directors, and it is really my pleasure to welcome you all here. I am also a member of the Washington, D.C. Forum, and we are thrilled to be hosting everybody for this inaugural event. We are describing this as a thought leadership event, and I hope um, everyone thinks about that as you listen to our great panel up here. Um, some of you may be familiar with the International Women's Forum and its Leadership Foundation. In fact, I suspect that almost everyone in the room is. But for those of, who, of you who are not, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the organization and our work. Um, IWF, the International Women's Forum, was founded in 1974 as a place where women of diverse accomplishment could come together and exchange ideas and experiences. Today, we have 6,800 members at the top of their fields from 33 countries across six continents. So that is really quite a, uh, an impressive organization. Um, we have heads of state, we have C-level corporate executives, we have entrepreneurs, nonprofit leaders, scientists, artists, leaders of, of NGOs, leaders of the military, and our membership is a powerful network of women all across the globe that is really not like any other. Um, 30 years ago, a group of our most thoughtful and prescient leaders, um, some of those of we honor today, realized that IWF had the potential as well as the responsibility to create a mechanism to advance women's leadership through training, mentoring, networking, and advocacy. These women, many of whom are in this room, created the IWF Leadership Foundation and its fellows program. One of the hallmarks of IWF has always been that our members support each other and support this mission, and they're willing to travel to do so. And I am very happy to say that we have members from eight countries across five continents here for this event. And what I haven't said is that the discussion today is the kickoff as a, of a celebration of the 25th anniversary of our fellows program. It's something that I am particularly proud of and that people in this room should really be proud of. This will be the next cohort will be our 25th cohort. Um, and I think the Leadership Foundation and the Fellows Program is really IWF's legacy. It was established to provide a faster start, a leg up, and a stronger glass-shattering hammer to the next generation of women leaders. Um, our flagship initiative, the Fellows Program that we are celebrating, was established in 1994 with seed funding from the Department of Labor as part of the Glass Ceiling Commission. So as we celebrate 25 years of impact through the Fellows Program, we really wanted to take the opportunity to review the progress that we've made as women leaders since the release of the Glass Ceiling Report, Solid Investment, and, the, and also talk about some of the challenges that remain today. So, with that as our opening, I would really like to turn it over to our moderator, Emmy-winning journalist and TV news executive, Betsy Fisher-Martin, my friend and also a member of the Washington, D.C. Forum. She's president of Fisher-Martin -Mar Media, and she's going to begin our conversation and act as the moderator and introduce our panelists. So, thank you very much, Betsy, for being here, and we look forward to our panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Holly. It's fun to see so many friends here. I feel like we're at kind of a mini IWF leadership conference. This is great, without having to travel to the ends of the earth for me. So uh, this is great. Um, as Holly mentioned, supporting women leaders is the mission of IWF. And it is as important today as it was in 1974 when the Women's Forum of New York was founded. Nearly two decades after IWF was established, the Glass Ceiling Commission issued its recommendations emphasizing that, quote, government must lead by example, followed by strong commitment and leadership from corporate America. Yet the commission said, quote, action by government and business are not enough. For real change to occur, bias and discrimination must be banished from the boardroom and executive suites of corporate America. And as a vehicle to achieve those goals, the IWF Leadership Foundation Fellows Program was born. 
We would like you to think about the role and responsibilities of government and corporate America today, and also consider the creation of the Fellows Program 25 years ago as a way to ch challenge and catalyze change. It's a great context for our conversation this afternoon. Some statistics for you to start off, because it wouldn't be an IWF event without some statistics. Um, the Fortune 500, annual for Fortune 500, was recently published. Um, the list and the CEI CEOs on it tell a story that emphasizes why we are here today. After reaching an all-time high of 32 female CEOs on the list in 2017, the number has actually now fallen down to 24. That's a one-year decline of 25%. But to put some things in perspective over time, in 1980, there were no women on the top executive ranks of the Fortune 100. And but by, 20, two, by, by 2001, 11% of those corporate leaders were women. And though the representation is still much less than it should be to ensure women's voices are heard in the boardroom, nearly 11% of the board seats of Fortune 500 companies are held by women, an increase of 18% since 1994. Someone's phone. But the glass ceiling evolved, in, has it evolved into a glass cliff? We will discuss some of that today and how can we accelerate the rate of positive change? We are in a much better place than we were in 1974 and even better than we were in 1993 when the Leadership Fellows Program began. The women on this panel all played a role in making that happen. From government service to corporate board service, from executive suite to mentoring young women, the collective stories of these women will illustrate how we've made progress, and their advice I know will help us achieve even more equality in the future. You all have copies on your chair of the impressive bios of our panelists, so I just want to point out the connectivity between them that makes them all really come together and tell the perfect story uh, of this afternoon. Starting with Barbara Franklin, she had a very important early role in advancing women into leadership positions in the federal government in the Nixon administration, and she has led by example as Secretary of Commerce, a corporate board member, and an international businesswoman. About a decade later, Carrie Dominguez, next to her there, began her work to build upon Barbara's foundation, leaving Bank of America to join Secretary Elizabeth Dole at the Department of Labor and leading an investigation into the employment policies and practices that either advanced or derailed the progress of women in corporate America, and thus launching the Glass Ceiling Initiative. Carrie eventually later becoming the director of the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission herself. So she hands the baton over to Lisa Ross, who was the deputy director of the Glass Ceiling Commission and worked closely with Glass Ceiling Commissioner and IWF member Carol Cox Waite, who I believe is here today, to obtain the initial funding for the Fellows Program. And Marty Wilkstrom has spent her entire career in the private sector at the heights of retail management. And she also has the cutest shoes on in the room, I will say as well. <laughs> Hiring and mentoring and supporting women. <laughs> You can, you can read her bio and see why. Uh, she was doing the private sector, what must need to be done to make change. So with that, uh, I want to start with Barbara, and I will come and join you. But Barbara, please tell us the story. Um, you had a role in bringing women leaders into the executive branch of government when you worked for the Nixon administration. Please share the story of your work there and tell us about your short-lived, ironic first title, which was, and you all will love this, the staff assistant to the president for executive manpower. <laughs> tell us about that. Well, before I get to that, I, I really want to say how thrilled I am to be part of this 25-year celebration. The older I get, the more I think leadership really counts and we need more women leaders. So hats off to the fellowship program. <laughs> well, to go back, uh, turn the clock back to 1971, this is what she's talking about. Um, and I had been sitting in the Bank of New York, what, what's now Citibank, as a woman AVP, assistant vice president. There were no, uh, there were three of us, no woman 
full vice president in the bank. I get a call from the White House saying, um, the president wants to advance women in the federal government. Would you consider coming and creating this function and, and doing this? And my friends told me to forget it. That administration will do nothing for women. Don't go. <laughs> well, I, I decided that they really were serious. The president was, so, so I did go. But this title shows the insensitivity <laughs> at the time. Uh, I got there and was put in front of the press after just a few weeks. And the women of the press were angry. Maybe some of you knew Helen Thomas and Fran Lewin and some of these people. <laughs> uh, and it was only the women that they put you in front of, too. Right? Yes, yeah. in the Roosevelt Room yeah. instead of the briefing room. Yeah. So they walk in, and they're, they're mad. Why, why are we different this way? And then the first question out of the box was just the one you asked. <laughs> How can you recruit women when your title is staff assistant for executive manpower? <laughs> and all I can tell you is there is no good answer to a question. <laughs> 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 and so things sort of went, went from bad to worse. Um, but actually, the press that came out of it was not too bad, it was okay, and at least the message was sent that something was happening mm -hmm. in, uh, in this White House, and that was really the, the important piece. But I have to say, it was a little bit of a shell shock, baptism by fire for me, mm -hmm. and it shows how insensitive everybody was about a title like that. The man who created it, <coughs> I have an allergy today, excuse me, <coughs> and me who didn't see it either. Yeah. <laughs> that was a problem. And so then anyway. you, you change was slow. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but you started at the time <laughs> trying to initiate things slowly. And you know, one thing that you tried to do uh, was use on the correspondence uh, Ms., the title Ms. for a woman. Yes. yes. That was and happening. that didn't go over well either. Well, yes. Uh, I got, <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got uh, a big. Uh, one of my letters that had come back or something, circle around Ms. from Rosemary Woods, who was the president's secretary, <laughs> saying, uh, we are Miss or Mrs. here. We are not Ms. So that ended that. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, though, I will say, she did succeed in tripling the number of women uh, hired to government positions uh, during her tenure there. Um, and you even got, uh, in the President's State of the Union address in 1972, yes. inserted in there, and I just want to read this uh, quote that he actually had in the State of the Union mm -hmm. address, while every woman may not want a career outside the home, every woman should have the freedom to choose whatever career she wishes and an equal chance to pursue it. That's right. Mm -hmm. So what was the backstory there? Well, there, there, uh, I knew Ray Price. She got it in there, though. Who was writing <laughs> this, this stuff for the president? And I mean, everybody bought mm -hmm. off on, on this, though. It wasn't yeah. as though we were out here in, in uh, some other country. And I really do believe that this president was ahead of his time on this. And it was totally unexpected uh, for him. Mm -hmm. But if you consider what was going on, some of you here have lived through it. There was not consensus in our society at that time about the role of woman, women. And in careers, uh, could women have careers and families? And careers were mostly teachers or nurses or secretaries. Other kinds of careers were, were, were fewer and far between. So the fact that here's a, a president who was thought to be conservative was, was going to advance women was, was a step ahead. And I really think that what, what that did at the end of the day was change the conversation around women's roles in our society. Now, not that he would have said he was trying to do that, but he was serious about advancing women. And, and it enabled some other things to happen. I mean, there are a bunch of, of laws that passed in, the, in those, those, those early 70s. Oh, yeah. um, the ERA being one, the Equal Employment Opportunity Act that gave the EEOC power to sue um, about discrimination yes, in, in courts. Um, Title IX. Title IX, mm -hmm. one of the biggest things that, that really, I think, has happened for women. Mm -hmm. The anniversary of that signing, by the way, is tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So we, we should cheer for yeah. Title IX yeah. today. I mean, that's really. <laughs> um, and the Equal, equal Credit. Opportunity Act was one of them too. But I think all of this was of a piece 
be because a president who was an unexpected one to do this um, made a visible effort to mm -hmm. advance women. I do have to say this. Not everybody thought this was a good idea. <laughs> and not everybody in that White House thought it was a good idea either. And they basically, you were there with no staff for a while either. Uh, no staff for a while. I borrowed someone from Citibank to come yeah. and open the mail. I mean, it was, it was. It's uh, not like they set you up with this job and gave you 50 people no, to. No, it didn't happen. Yeah. I had to commandeer the, the, uh, the staff. The other thing I really had to do was to build alliances and friends all over the place, in the White House and in the departments and agencies, so that I would know when jobs were coming up. Because if I didn't, couldn't get there with women candidates, mm -hmm. you know, a job would disappear or someone, somebody's friend would get it, it instantly. So I, I feel that that kind of alliance building mm -hmm. is, uh, is, is really important. The other thing about this effort that made it work, and I gotta say, I didn't do all this myself. <laughs> we never do everything alone. We have lots of people who help, because there were a bunch of men who helped, too. The president required the cabinet secretaries and agency heads to give him action plans about how they were gonna advance women in their departments and agencies. Mm -hmm. And there was a date certain when those plans had to come back and there was someone in each department who was designated to be the, the keeper of the flame, as it were. Now, part of what I was doing, of course, most of what I was doing was recruiting. And I was beating the bushes. I went all over the country looking for sources, looking for candidates, looking for whatever, 24-7. Uh, but I also had to monitor how the, how the departments and agencies were doing with respect to their plans. And there were goals. This is another key thing about this. There were goals. Mm -hmm. And there was a monitoring of how we were doing in terms of the goals. The first year goal from the president, I'm sorry, I keep, <coughs> I keep coughing. <laughs> and I apologize. Yeah, I have water. I just, um, was to double the number of women in the policy making jobs. Mm -hmm. We managed to triple that in a year. And mm -hmm. I think, uh, wow. yeah, triple it in the first year. I think the really important thing about that, though, mm -hmm. is that most a majority, I think I'm correct in saying, of the women appointed were in jobs that women had never held before. Mm. Breaking, breaking through, breaking barriers. And those women uh, were successful. If you remember, uh, some of them, Dixie Lee Ray, who was Atomic Energy Commission, became the governor of the state of Washington later. Marina Whitman, Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, there were just a, a slew of So it really of them is like sort of that. the breaking of that. It started to break, yes. Yeah. And once you, you bust through it, then yeah. it's not so hard the next time. Yeah. The other thing that happened was at the middle level, and what, what, well, it was then GS 13 to 15. I'm not sure what it is today. But there were 1,000 women who were advanced in that, mm. uh, in that category uh, during this time. At the, and the federal government shrunk for, mm -hmm. I think, for five uh, was shrinking like 5%. I could be wrong in the percent, but there was a shrinkage of the government. And those jobs, many of them, were non-traditional for women also, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. narcotics agents or tugboat captains. Oh, and the first women generals and admirals came mm -hmm. at, at this time, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there were just a lot of things that, that, that broke through. Yeah. And as I look back on it, um, the barriers have pretty much stayed down. We still don't have enough women leaders in the Congress or in <laughs> elective office, but I think the executive branch has continued to, to uh, move forward. And the CIA was one I never thought we'd crack. Right. And that right. now has happened. Right. So, right. Right. okay, yeah. there's still a few more, yeah. but uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased with, with where we've come. But it was, um, how, how would I characterize it? I'm proud of having done it. It was. Um, a character building experience. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other thing <laughs> we talked about ahead of time, I tried, I never tried to be confrontational with any of these people mm. who really thought this was not such a great idea and what, what were you doing. Um, some women's group, so I tried, I used humor as much as, as I could. And besides that, I grew up as the principal's daughter, which meant being nice to everybody. So <laughs> I had to be nice to everybody in that role, too. Uh, uh, several women's groups um, wanted to give a bust of Susan B. Anthony to the White House. 
And we said, oh, that's wonderful. And so they got her copied, the one that's in the crypt of the Capitol, who is marble. This one came in bronze or something. She's really severe looking if she's bronze. Anyway, she showed up, and we had to wait to get a time to present this to the White House. And while we were waiting, she resided in the closet of my office in the third <laughs> floor of the old EOB. <laughs> and in the dead of night, sometimes, she would steal out of there <laughs> and land in the office of someone who had said or done something detrimental <sighs> to women. <laughs> And I said, I'm not going to name names, she but you can she wouldn't go there. probably <laughs> guess. So then I just had to go and pick her up in the morning, bring her back, and put her in the closet. <laughs> yeah. And then she was presented. She stood uh, on a pedestal at the entrance of the East Wing for, um, I, I think, two, this would have been 1973, I think about 20 years. I don't know where she is now. I'd really like to <laughs> find like her. her. Again, she's probably in the basement of the White House. But, but it Maybe was someone a, uh, can tweet that out and we'll find her or something. But it was a statement yeah. that I think was an important statement to make at the time. So fast forwarding from there, and Carrie, as, you're at Bank of America. And what yes. year were you there? Um, I, I think, yeah. So well, first of all, the, this is a perfect segue. Yeah. And I do have to say, talk about manpower, my first corporate board was on the board of Manpower Group. And I, and I, I said to the CEO, it's going to ruin my reputation. I mean, I can't go. But it was a branding issue. He said, we do have red women. But, but the manpower thing really yes. resonates across. Yes. So I was at Bank of America. Uh, we're talking mid to late 1980s. Um, uh, I was in charge of the top 200 executives at Bank of America, executive staffing, executive development, succession planning, diversity, executive comp, and all that. We had 200. 63% uh, of the workforce at B of A was made up of women. We only had three women at the SVP level. Mm -hmm. Only three, less, less than 1%. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went to the CEO and I said, we have a problem. Now, here's, this is something interesting. The CEO had three daughters. Nixon had two daughters. Yes. So the key yes. thing is yeah. to talk to CEOs with right. daughters because it really does help a lot mm -hmm. to, to try to. And he was paying all kinds well of money to put his uh, daughters through uh, uh, college and all that. So we want to make sure that they had an opportunity. So back in 1986, there was an article that came out in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, entitled The Corporate Woman. Uh, and in that, that's where the glass ceiling term became coined. Mm -hmm. It was a mm. picture of women climbing up this ladder uh, and then looking through, bumping against this invisible ceiling, and then on the other side of the ceiling, there were men. And so it talks about the, <laughs> the organizational, the cultural issues affecting women. So I had mm -hmm. that information that women at Bank of America calling me and said, what are we going to do about this? 63% of us, and, and uh, we don't seem to be able to get to the top. We keep bumping against these barriers. So armed with the glass ceiling, I went to the CEO and I said, uh, we really should do an investigation and just find out what is the culture, what's, what's uh, helping women, what's hindering women from advancement. So uh, I launched a major research, major uh, interviews of the women. Uh, I remember one woman saying, you know, when I joined Bank of America with, a bank, uh, with an MBA from Stanford, I thought I could be God. I thought that the world was open to me. Now I'm lucky if I can get the VP title. I mean, there was yeah. a lot yeah. of disappointment back then. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did. We completed the, the report, presented it to the CEO and the management committee. Uh, and the recommendations were accepted. Uh, and so it was right there, I mean, timing is everything. It was right there when I got a call uh, from Elizabeth Dahl's office, and they said, uh, we're looking for somebody that's got both private sector and public sector experience, uh, and we'd like to, you know, for you to consider coming to join our team. 
So I come from San Francisco, interview with her, and she says to me, well, what would you do if you were to join the, my administration? And I said, you know, I just finished this glass ceiling initiative at Bank of America, and if it's happening there, as progressive as they are, it's got to be happening all over. So I would love to do some public policy making that will really cover all sectors, all areas uh, uh, of employment. And see, she, she jumped up from her couch, and she pressed the intercom, and in walked uh, uh, her former solicitor of labor, and she said, Bob, Carrie has just accepted. <laughs> and she said, when can you start? And I said, after marriage counseling in two months. <laughs> My husband didn't want to come back east. <laughs> and then July 30th, 1999, the nation learned about the glass ceiling initiative that you did. The 91, front, 19, The front page of the New York Times yeah, said, yeah, Labor yeah, Department 99. wants to take on bias in executive suite. Yes, so we were quietly working on this uh, uh, project when all of a sudden Peter Kilburn of the New York Times mm -hmm. broke the story. And I say I brought, I brought a copy and it's, it's going to be shared. Uh, and it just said, you know, the Labor Department wants to take, I think it was July of 1990. Right, when the, the work according to my yeah. yeah. uh, The next <laughs> week, I was on the Today Show, uh, and you know, Barbara, you talk about being conservative. One of her advisors, uh, one of Elizabeth's advisors said to me, well, Carrie, you're going to be in the Today Show with Deborah Norville, Mary oh, Deborah yeah. Norville. Uh, and they said, uh, there's going to be a very conservative chief of staff to the president who's going to be watching you, <laughs> um, and al along with 26 million other people. But don't worry about the 26. <laughs> worry about the, <laughs> the president's <laughs> chief of staff. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that was what triggered the complete, you know, just the, the, the initiative blew wide open. We had letters from women. I had a woman who wrote and said, glass ceiling? I have an MBA and I'm in a glass cave. I'm in the bottom. I can't even get to the first floor. Yeah. We yeah. had such wonderful information that came out from the women that, that helped. So that, so uh, anyway, uh, and Jenna Dorn was a major uh, helper uh, to that process. She was one of Elizabeth's advisors and she really could relate to what we were, and, and very supportive of that. So I don't think we could have launched it without, without her help and, and uh, others, uh, colleagues that, that were supportive. But anyway, to make a long story short, um, uh, we, uh, we, this, is, this is a report that was published in July or August of 91. Elizabeth left uh, the beginning of 91, and then right. this became published. And then Bob Dole, who was the Senate Republican leader, says, this is great information. Let's enact legislation for a glass ceiling commission. Uh, and it was his work that became uh, included in the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1991 which George Herbert Walker Bush signed in November mm -hmm. of, of 91, and that established the Glass Ceiling Commission. Yeah, yeah, that, that yeah so <laughs> passing the baton right along here. Lisa was the deputy director of the Glass Ceiling Commission, and she was also instrumental in obtaining the funding, as we mentioned earlier, for the IWF <laughs> Fellow Program. So tell us about your role, Lisa, and a little bit about how the Fellows Program came out of that. Well, I think the thing that strikes me about this conversation so far is the uh, power and beauty of women and when and how we support each other. Mm -hmm. And when I think about your story, Barbara, I've shared with many of you that my mother was a low-ranking mm -hmm. person in the federal government, and I now realize that because of your work, she was able to escalate um, in the 70s and 80s and become the highest-ranking woman of color at HEW at that time. So I thank you for that. Um, and thank then, you. Carrie, I think about the work that you've talked about. Uh, and the initiative, and I remember seeing this report, mm -hmm. and this was early in my career, early in my career, and um, I was with the administration, I was working for Bob Reich, and I met this really interesting, fascinating um, woman named Stephanie Swirsky, who's here in the audience, and uh, she was a career DOL person, and she said, I'm working on this really interesting initiative with Renee Redwood who was the uh, commissioner of the Federal Glass Ceiling Secretary. Commission, and in your extra time, you should help out. And it is because of Stephanie <laughs> that I uh, got to know Renee and began to work on this report. 
and was smart enough because my mother told me to ask for a title. <laughs> Good there for you her. Go. I, I don't even know if Stephanie remembers this, but um, because you know the role of mentoring. And my mother said, don't do it unless you get a title. Mm -hmm. And Renee was already the director. And I was like, what about a deputy director? <laughs> and they said, sure. <laughs> and uh, I worked very, very hard on that. And I see uh, Lynn here and Carol here. And the work that that commission did is groundbreaking. It all started here, but it came to life. And I think it was groundbreaking for a number of reasons. It was bipartisan. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this was a That's time right. where we valued different points of view. Uh, you were afraid to make a move unless you had engaged the opinion of everyone because there was a recognition that you can't do anything for anyone unless you are informed by everyone. And we had different points of view and we listened to those different points of view. And we looked at the role, not only of how women would advance, but uh, it's called minorities. I don't use that term. Uh, it's emerging majorities or people of color. And so it was the first time we started to couple those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, the results are, they're, they're, the results of the report were terrific. Uh, the outcomes are not amazing. I look at these numbers and they're disappointing to me. And we have really, quite frankly, worked too hard. Yes. Uh, and we will have to work harder for the numbers to be better than they are. You know, 1995, my, my son was a baby. He's getting married in two weeks. Uh, the experience and those numbers need to be better. And I think as we continue to work together, as we continue to honor our past and look towards our future, which is out here in this room, uh, I think that's when we can make significant difference. But that's why it was successful, because it represented the opinions of, bear, of a lot of people. Uh, it was like this room, which strikes me. It was, uh, it was well, it was not very gender diverse, but it was relatively gender diverse. Uh, but it was uh, racially diverse. It was geographically diverse. Uh, there were different points of view. There were different political pers uh, persuasions. There were different industries, different sectors represented. Um, it is literally like this room and why I think your organization is so incredibly successful because it brings in a lot of different points of view and makes recommendations that are resonant. Mm -hmm. So uh, the fellows program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One of the uh, most significant things that I think that we learned is, uh, and we talked about success metrics. And we now know that uh, if this concept, if you can see it, you can be it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So women have to see women like us in positions if that's what they want to do. Uh, mm -hmm. You need a network of support. What you were able to do, Barbara, without that network of support is remarkable. I don't know what I would do without what I call my Wakanda, uh, <laughs> my, my group of sisters and brothers of all hues who have helped me to break through glass ceilings. And so, uh, and then the third concept is of putting women in a position where they can learn from each other, they can support each other in a cohesive manner, which is the fellows program. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. Edelman is uh, a participant in the, in the fellows program and we also are a supporter of the organization. And we did the other thing that the commission report talked about the recommendations and that is to put your money where your values are. So mm -hmm. as an organization, we value the ascension and the leadership of women. As an organization, we value the ascension and leadership of people of color, people who think differently, of people who, who believe different things. And so in doing that, we, have, we participate in the fellows program and we also are a um, pro bono sponsor of, of this incredible organization. Mm -hmm. And I think the beauty of the fellows program is what I, uh, I called my colleague who is participating now. And I expected it to be a five minute conversation. I had to, you know, we had to end it at 45. And um, I think the most telling thing about it is when I first got here, someone said to me, maybe you will be in the fellows program. And having grown up in this space, I was like, I'm good. I mean, I've done that stuff. And uh, I, my colleague said, you haven't done anything like this. <coughs> She said, this fellows program is absolutely amazing. And I think one of you asked me, why does it work? Uh, it works because uh, it is sector uh, generic. So there's no competition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're not afraid to be yourself or to tell 
trade secrets because you're not competing with each other. Uh, it works because people are from all over, and so you're learning and teaching at the same time. Uh, it works because you get business from it. I mean, that's a reality of it. It's the other thing we learned from Glass Ceiling Commission, it's, it's about business. It's business outcomes. And so I think the concept that uh, was conceived with the Glass Ceiling Commission is brought to life in the most realistic and the most tangible and quite frankly the most beautiful way through this fellows program because it is advancing these issues and it is creating um, a future where these numbers will be different than they are now. And Marty, you started uh, your career on the sales floor at Nordstrom uh, and ended up running one of the most iconic stores in the world, Harrods in London. Um, tell us about your experience and also just in terms of retail always having been a good place for women, but then not at the very top. Right. Um, right. Talk a little bit yeah, about your Well, experience. first of all, I have to say we come full circle because yeah. when I moved to Washington, D.C., um, I'd run the biggest business unit for uh, Nordstrom in Southern California, and I came to the smallest because we had a single right. store. Mm -hmm. And the proposition was we need you to transfer the culture so we can open the East Coast. And uh, Barbara was on the Nordstrom board at the time, and so yeah. was Anne McLaughlin. Mm -hmm. And Barbara mm -hmm. came and found me, and she said, you've got to join this organization. I said, I'm not really a joiner. I'm really busy. <laughs> and I also have you know, a two-and-a-half-year-old. And she said, no, you've got to do this. And then I think we were talking today about who's second in my nomination. I think it was Kay Graham, who became a great friend. <laughs> I think and it uh, she was. said, no, you've yeah. got to join this organization. So I mean, when these two women tell you you've got to do something, you've got to do it. <laughs> and I've been forever grateful for that opportunity, so thank you very much. I, uh, it was an accident, I said, you know, really in those days, you know, even coming out of university, you'd say, you know, I'll scrub the baseboards with a toothbrush if you'll give me a shot. Um, so that's what I did, and I went to uh, work for Nordstrom 18 hours a week, which was probably gonna just be a few months, and mm. stayed almost 20 years. And when I started with the company, it was 250 million, and when I left, it was six and a half billion, almost seven billion with 45,000 employees. So it was, a, it was a big change. And one of the greatest parts of my life was to come here to Washington, D.C., where we had no business at all, and mm, to build the business right. on the East Coast to about 1.7 billion that's before right. I went back to Seattle. So it was a very interesting time, but uh, we were, uh, I was quite uh, gender uh, blind because I was trying to hire the best people. And I, we were also moving people because in our culture we like to promote from within. And so we were moving people across the nation. And so when we moved the, the wife, we moved the husband, and the husband and the wife, and you were just trying to build a coalition of people who could understand the service proposition that we were trying to provide at that time. So it was an amazing, and um, everything I've uh, achieved since has really come from that experience. Mm. And I'm here in Washington, D.C. with all my wonderful friends. It's <laughs> just been absolutely fantastic. You know? And you've been a mentor yourself to so many women. I, I have. I, I got involved when I moved to London. Uh, I went on the board of not only the IWF, but the foundation. And I think at that time, I was the only person that did that crossover, which was kind of crazy at the time because I was pretty busy. But um, yeah, I got involved at that point, And I really realized that I love the foundation because to open up an opportunity for women. I think also moving to London, I uh, said, how is it? I said, well, I think I, I, I know the language. This is, this is a start. <laughs> and I realized in six months, I don't know the language. They kept saying, my husband said, how was your first meeting? I go, it was great. They said they'd give it a think. <laughs> that meeting goes in the trash can. And uh, yeah, yeah, it needs a little work. That means there is, you know, there's, there's nothing going to be done with it at all. So I realized very quickly I didn't know the language at all. It would have been better to be uh, working in French. Um, at least I would have known I didn't know the language, but but it was uh, it was a great and I, I ran you know this British institution and uh, was the first woman in that at that time in about 175 years to run Harrods and still the only woman who's ever run Harrods. But when I went there, I realized not only um, was this important, but I had no global. Um, platform. I had never been together with a group of global women. Yeah. I had no safe zone um, at all, and I had never been a part of that. And can you imagine the opportunity, uh, especially if you're going to look at the world in a global uh, in a global way, to be a young woman and have that opportunity? And I thought that's where I'm going to put my time and my energy is with all of those women who can learn so much, and they're going to be so much better than I ever could be. There was one young woman that you promoted to her first uh, CEO role, who's had some very 
public recent success. Tell us about that. Yeah, I've, I've, hi I've hired a lot of uh, women in top jobs all over the world when I was at Richemont, and you're referring to somebody. She wasn't actually the CEO, although I did put somebody in one of my portfolio companies. I just hired a woman who came from New York who's going to run a big company in London, and she started on Monday. Yes. Yay. So this is really important, and she's going to be fantastic. Um, but I think who you're referring yeah. to is I um, hired a woman to be the creative director, which is like being the top job at, at, a, at a fashion house at Chloe in, in um, uh, at Richemont in, in uh, Paris. And one thing you have to know about Richemont is when I joined, the top people in the company, the top 90 people were all men. Um, and there were 23 men in the boardroom. So when I walked in, it was quite quite a shock, I guess. But uh, so I trotted on my way, and I uh, our our Chloe business needed a lot of work. And I looked around the world and found this woman by the name of Claire Waite Keller. And I thought I think she's the perfect person for all kinds of reasons to take that job because of her temperament, uh, her behavior, her work ethic, and her aesthetic. So I hired her to that job. Well, now, um, and Claire has publicly talked about this, but she was eight months pregnant at the time I hired her. Mm. And she's actually, um, there was a statement that she made uh, a while back, and she said there's not another person in the industry in the world that would have given me that job. But I got a lot of heckling. I got heckling from yep. the fashion mm -hmm. magazines. I got heckling from a lot of people about why I did that. Mm -hmm. But I thought and knew that I thought she was, I, mean, just, I just knew she was the right person for that job. And she became a superstar, uh, an absolute superstar. And she doubled the business at Chloe. And then when I left, they didn't treat her quite well. You know, when you talk about how you get treated, and one of the reasons she wasn't treated very well there is because she wanted to know the strategy of the business and they wanted her to, they just wanted to tap her on the head and say, don't worry, you just design clothes. Mm. And she was so much smarter than that. So Bernard Arnault and Karl Lagerfeld came and got her, and she went to Givenchy. And so the reason you might know her name is because she just made Meghan Markle's wedding dress. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because she's now heading the house of Givenchy. So you, 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 you know, uh, there, so there you have it. And uh, we had a good yeah. laugh. She came to the house before Christmas for dinner, and, you know, she... She couldn't tell. She, even her kids didn't know she was doing that job because if they went to school and said, oh, you know, yeah, my yeah, mom's yeah, making okay. the wedding dress, so, uh, you know, nobody in her household until she was getting dressed the morning of the wedding. And she was there putting the veil in the two little yes. boys' hands oh, wow. as they went up the stairs. So uh, she is a superstar, and uh, we need more women designing for women. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, Barbara, you were Secretary of Commerce, um, had a, a career in politics. Um, talk a little bit about women in politics and why it's important, um, especially now, I think, too, to have their, have their voice. Well, it just is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really think that, that decision-making, I don't care where it is, it could be boardroom decision-making, is, uh, is, is, is better it's uh, stronger, it's more inclusive, it's just saner mm -hmm. if you have women around that table, wh or wherever it is, whether it's on the hill or a boardroom table. And, uh, and not just one. I mean, I was the, the only woman on, on really seven large company boards of directors in the 80s before I became Commerce Secretary. Being the only one is a tough, tough duty, so I'm glad some of this has has changed, but it's still not where it, it needs to be. But I just really believe women bring, bring some different experiences and skills and mindsets and culture. I mean, there's something about the way our brains work that is even, even different. We get more intuitive input into whatever is going on here, uh, and, and we, we, need to, uh, we need to use it. That's why we need, we need more women. I, and someone said it here, we need to keep working. Mm -hmm. We need to keep pushing where, where there, there's, there are these gaps. And whether it's uh, in elective office, where there's definitely a gap, whether it's CEOs, boardrooms, wherever it is, mm -hmm. we, we, need to keep, uh, we need to keep pushing from the outside. But I think from those where we are inside of an organization, we really need to keep pushing, too. Mm -hmm meaning supporting other women, mentoring yes. other women, right. uh, wh whatever, it, whatever it takes. It's just got to be right there at the top of our list. <laughs> Carrie, you've used the term invisible barriers. Uh, talk a little bit about the, the barriers then and the, the barriers that still exist today. 
Well, the, the barriers have gotten a little bit more subtle than they were back yeah. in the yes, 1980s, right. 1990s, but yes. they're right. still there. Right. They're, you know, they're attitudinal barriers. Yep. They're uh, cultural barriers, you know, an organizational culture. What, what is it? What, is, what are the behaviors that it rewards? Uh, there's some effort, you know, you set the tone at the top and depending on the leadership and those uh, corporations, um, some of these barriers could be overcome. So maybe the barrier, maybe the, the ceiling is a little thinner than it was back in the 1980s and 90s and even 2000. But, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have placement issues. The women would get placed in the staff jobs, the men yeah. would get placed That's in right. the line jobs. Right. And the positions that would lead to the top would be the line jobs. Yeah. We had uh, lack of visibility and exposure. Women wouldn't have access to uh, rotational assignments, to corporate uh, uh, yeah. presentations, those types of things. So I think that's improved quite a bit. Uh, but we still, you know, right now with the whole the, the family leave and the kinds of, how do you balance? I think so has that really glass biggest. cliff then replaced the ceiling? I think the, the cliff, well, I'm not sure how we're defining the cliff here, but a you lot of the women, yeah. yeah, a lot of the women uh, are given these wonderful jobs when the company is going down. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that is true. Mm -hmm. And so they say, you know, how far and farther down can it go? Right. Let's right. get a woman in here. Right. Uh, and you know who's a perfect example of that? Anne Mulcahy. Mm. When Anne Mulcahy became CEO of Xerox, right. that company was going way, way under. And they figure, well, let's give it to her and let's see, you know. Of course. And then if it doesn't work, we'll blame her, you know. Well, Mary Barra at, at the <laughs> yeah. GM exactly. was sitting on top of a real mess, mm -hmm. and there were those who were out to get her. She's risen above it. Yes. She's yes. done it. Right. Yes. Right. An amazing job. Yeah. yeah, so you either have to exactly <laughs> either have to do it or, or whatever, but you're quite right about that. Yeah. Exactly. The other, the other, you know, <laughs> it was interesting whenever I would meet with uh, CEOs in the course of the investigations, they would come up to me, well, we don't have a class ceiling. And then you would look at the demographics and, <laughs> And they, they'd say, well, what do women want? You know, what is it that women want? Mm. Remember that Mel Gibson movie, yes. What yes. Women Want? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, we don't have to be electrocuted by a hairdryer to know what women want. I mean, we know what women want. They want equal opportunity, yes. equal access, yeah. to rise above and as high as their talents and, and abilities are. Mm. And, and equal pay. pay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you yeah. say these things, and they make a lot of sense. But then the implementation, we had a lot of what we call the meddling middle, the people in the mm -hmm. middles of the corporations. Just don't, because people at the top think, oh, everything is happening, I tell them to do this, it happens. It doesn't always happen, because mm -hmm. you've got, it's, yeah. it's the middle where everything gets stuck. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it is. Yeah. Yep. Lisa, you work with a lot of young women uh, in the public relations business. What, do you, what advice do you give them starting out in their careers? I think uh, I repeat the advice that someone gave me early on, and that was to know your power and to use it for good. I think a lot of um, I think a lot of us underestimate ourselves. Uh, we are we're afraid to ask. Uh, we are uncomfortable. You talk about being the only one. Everything that you all have talked about is five times amplified for women of color. Five times amplified for women of color. So the number of times that I am and have been the only woman of color in a room, uh, the only person of color in a room, the only woman in a room. Um, it's been a while, but the only young person in a room. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but we all have had that experience of being the only one. And um, I, what I tell young women in, in our industry is filled with women, but it is led by men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your colleague, Marjorie Krauss at APCO, uh, yeah. was a part of her own glass ceiling breaking, not only for what she did, but when she hired me as the managing director for APCO Worldwide in DC, where I was the first woman of color to lead a major office. And so mm -hmm. she broke her ceiling, and then she allowed other people to break the ceiling. So. You know, I don't know if you all saw, I, I kind of looked at it as my Bible. Um, this article is in the Times maybe three months ago that was an interview with women who were almost CEOs. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you mm -hmm. saw it, but it was like women who were like mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. And either they took themselves out or they were taken out. Mm -hmm. And they talked about the things that prevented them from ascending. And it wasn't so much pipeline. It was the soft skills. It was the people in the middle who were not responsive That's to right. them. Mm -hmm. It was navigating family. 
Um, yeah. I don't know that I could run um, my office now. I don't know that I could be the president of, uh, of Edelman now. I can do it now, but I probably couldn't have done it five years ago. My children were, you know, 10 years ago. My children needed too much from me. I was caring for my mother, so part of it is timing. But men often don't have to make those decisions. They just do it. Uh, th these women talked about being afraid of, uh, they called it tooting their own horn. I talk about explaining who you are. Uh, you know, you're not tooting your own horn when you're talking about what you bring to the table and how you can advance something. But a lot of times we're uncomfortable with that. Um, I was raised uh, with three older brothers and some seriously uh, aggressive parents, so I never had that problem. <laughs> uh, and, and I knew that I had to. I knew that I had to, and I was never uncomfortable, but I think many times we are. Yeah. So I, I tell these young women, but I also tell these young men, because it has to be both. I uh, Know your power, use it for good, and every time you are helped, know that you are responsible for helping someone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. great. That's true. Marty, what's your advice? Oh, young for young women? people? Yeah. Well, I, um, I spend quite a bit of time with young people, mm -hmm. actually, and I've taken up a role as, um, I, 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 I'm a fellow at Cambridge, and really what I work with is young people, but I do also set three days a week, I mean three days a month aside, uh, to do, oh, a week would be great. <laughs> no, three days a month aside to do nothing but spend with young people. Um, because I have people that call me about career advice, mm -hmm. thought, jobs, all those kinds of things. So I do spend a lot of time, um, which I think is really important. But my greatest advice to anyone is uh, the reason I got where I am, because I, I always say I'm the least likely person in the world to run a Swiss holding company. Come on, <laughs> really. I grew up on a ski hill in Colorado. You know, it's just not possible. But I got something very early in my career that I didn't understand how valuable it was, and that is I got um, an operating role that had a P&L with a top and bottom mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. So yeah. at first it was like, isn't that interesting? Interesting. Well, when business is good, all ships rise. Boy, that happened again. Isn't that an interesting <laughs> coincidence? Wow, yes. that is amazing. And all of a sudden, it didn't have to do with my, my hair or my gender or my... It had to do with the way I led people. Mm -hmm. And it had to do with having people come around me and we could figure out a way uh, to make a success. So um, that is really what I tell people. If you have a chance, it's not that I don't respect HR, PR, any of those roles, but if you have a chance to get into a line job, and what I tell women is do not be afraid. So many women are afraid. I said if I have a person, two absolutely dead equal uh, candidates, um, and it's a man and a woman, the man will tell me all the reasons why he's totally uh, qualified, and the woman will say, I'm very good at all these things, and this is where I think I have deficits for yes. this job. Right. And I just yeah. said last week in a class of like 400 students, don't do that anymore. Stop it. Right. Just stop it. I said, you know what? Fear is a really great motivator. <laughs> I said, I've been afraid. I've been terrified half my life. So I said, you know, <laughs> With jump in. We all jump have. in and go. You may <laughs> surprise yourself. And I said, what is the worst absolute worst thing that could happen, you'd fail. That would be the worst thing that could right. happen. And maybe your failure would have nothing to do with your performance. Maybe it's just a coincidence in the world today. So um, that would be the, the advice I give is go for it. But you know, when you turn in results, sooner or later, people cannot ignore it. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you open it up. And once you open it up, you can open it for all kinds of women behind you. Mm -hmm. and, and that was really the greatest recommendation from the Federal Glass Ceiling Commission was it's good for business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. It's mm -hmm. good for business. You and know, people listen right. to that. And people, too, right? well, right. it's what matters. Yeah. It's what matters. All of us, you know, you are only successful if you know how to handle money. You know how to handle your own money, and you know how to handle your organization's money, and you know how to make money. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's the other thing we get yeah. really confused about. At the end of the day, it make, is about, it's making about making money. money. Yeah for your organization and for yourself. Yeah. And everybody, even people in PR, have to do that. By the way, <laughs> people every, in PR people, people, people have to. Me out of trouble. Yeah, that's right. I mean, people, no, but I mean, that's what everybody <laughs> has to do that. And I think you, when you put women in positions where, you know, you have to be comfortable with math, you have to be comfortable with saying no, you have to be comfortable with saying yes, but you have to understand at the end of the day, it is about business and profitability. Um, and I think when you get that, then you do okay. And yeah. nobody says no to green. <laughs> nobody says no to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want to open it up to questions in just a minute? You wanted to add something. I just wanted to say something about 
um, young people entering, yeah. um, especially women, is to think about, I mean, have some goals for yourself. Yeah. I'm yeah. Big, and, and the results count. I totally they, agree they with totally that. But count. have some goals. Figure out really what, what, where you want to go, how, what, your, what your life balance should look like. The and, timing. And, like and, the, and the timing. timing. And, timing. and paint your own picture here. Yeah. Uh, this was what equality that we were right. all involved in way back was all about. Uh, don't be bound by stereotypes, but, right. but create your own path and right. do it your own way. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would, would tell them. But think about it. Right. Think about it. I can remember going back to a reunion at Harvard Business School, 10-year reunion, and all of the men, there were so few women in that class, all the men were talking about their 30-year plans mm -hmm. and where they were. Did any of us right. women have 30-year plans? No, yeah. because we were not counseled yes. to have 30-year plans. Yes. So I would tell, not that you have to have when you're entering a 30-year plan, but I would tell young women, ha have some goals. Right. Think about where you want to go. I just wanted to add there. one more thing. I just read, um, I was at the McKinsey World um, Women's Leadership Conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they. Um, published all of their information, and one of the things that was the biggest aha when I read all of the documents, uh, that first leadership, women are not finding barriers to come into organizations today, right. but the first promotion is really a tough one, and many more men are promoted in that first promotion, and if we would clean that up, we might change mm -hmm. uh, the texture of organizations. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the dreaded two letters earlier, Marty, and I, I want to be sure to get to this point, HR. Uh, in the context of the Me Too discussion that is happening now. Um, uh, Carrie, I'll start with you, but anybody jump in on this. How has the landscape changed in the context of, of Me Too? Well, I, I think, you know, I think this is different from the other kinds of women's movements that mm -hmm. we've had because it has become so, it, it's picked up a lot of traction. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's gotten to the point where there really is no, no turning back. I think it's going to be ever present. Uh, but sexual harassment is something that continues, has been around for a long, long time, right. continues sure. to be <laughs> a, a huge challenge. The uh, EEOC is having another year worth of, uh, of uh, commission hearings on the, the subject of sexual harassment. Uh, and it's not just you know subordinate and to supervisor. It, it could be co-workers, right. it could be contractors mm -hmm. harassing. Yeah. So it's really gotten a lot more complex and complicated. Mm -hmm. And I think women need to know, is it unwelcome and unwanted? You know, then you have to, like, to your point, you, mm -hmm. you, you have to step up and say, I, I don't want, I don't appreciate that. That is, that is something that is not acceptable mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, but women need to do it and, yes. you know. Now you can do it yeah. and be listened yeah. to. And right. Back in the days when I was chased around a few desks, mm -hmm. there was yeah. nobody to tell. Right. <laughs> no, and nobody caught me either. I know. There were, I mean, who, who, would, who would believe us? Well, no, there was no, no, my point is yeah. serious. There was, there was no recourse. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Precisely. Right. Mm -hmm. right. That's the way it was, right? They'd probably say, because you're so beautiful. What can we do? <laughs> and think it's a compliment. Yeah, right. think of the compliment. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Carol. All right, I think we can uh, open up for some questions now. We have some microphones, I believe. Um, I think we have, we'll start up here, okay. uh, and just wait for the microphone. And if you would uh, introduce yourself, that would be great. The microphone is coming along here. There we go. Yes, thank you. There you go. Thank you. I, I have a comment rather than question, and it plays off of something Barbara said about identifying where the openings were. Mm -hmm. I think we have fallen into a trap of measuring the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. We measure how many more women we have in a position than we did last year. What we need to look at is how many opportunities we had to fill jobs and how many of them were filled with women or people of mm -hmm. color. We aren't gonna fire people to change the profile of a company. But when we have an opportunity to change things, like Barbara, find those places and put yeah. the right people in them, and then you'll see things really change. Just measuring the number of people in jobs over years is meaningless. Focus on the opportunities to change and what we do with that. Mm -hmm. yeah, That's you. a good point. Good mm -hmm. point. Uh, yeah, over here in the blue. Do we have two microphones or just one? Okay. Oh, go ahead. You have one. Super. Go ahead. 
And now they look over here. Thanks for Thanks. this panel for all your leadership. So I am sure women have some some improvement and but still a long way to go. And uh, we have a EOC, we are women facing, we have a, a peace a, a peace movement and we have a, a Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. But the problem if you compare EEOC movement if you compare it, 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 it complain fire with the EEOC after more than a, a, a half a century, it's still going nowhere. And she let it all because of improper processing or complaint, and they last for decades after decade. Even if you won and the double trip to the Supreme Court, then it's really unusual. This procedure mm, error is obviously, but we do have Me Too movement. And uh, Me Too now is very interesting, though. What they say is now, even just touch, not even rape or m m by something else or violence, that just touch the hand or the back is in trouble. Maybe if you say that this morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, the men will be resigned or fired. So I just wonder if this leadership group, would you be able to convince something to the administration or to the corporate media and tell them what we have to do to make a real change? Because it is by merit, by EEOC cannot do anything, but me too, without anything of violence or violation of the law, but can go somewhere. Something is, is interesting that we got to pursue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 well, there's clearly a lot of um, a lot of support outside of the, the federal government. Although the federal government does have a play to a, a role to play, and and they have played it. But at the Davos conference, you know, a lot of the women and the men were saying, "We're confused. We don't know what sexual harassment is. You know, how do I know if I compliment <laughs> yeah, someone?" Uh, and someone said, "Just follow the three C's. If if the action is whether it's clueless." Creepy or criminal? Clueless, <laughs> 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 clueless, like <laughs> creepy, or criminal. That's what it is. You know, based on that, if the guy is clueless, <laughs> right? right. What <laughs> yeah, can you introduce yourself? Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Donna Miller, and I'm the CEO of Purse Power. We're working to help women use their massive purchasing power to drive positive change. Mm -hmm. All right. The question I have for you is, how do we get women to support women? We're going to give people a mechanism for knowing which companies are owned or led by women. Yes. How do we get women to buy from them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, first of all, I think yeah. you, you, you can have women-owned companies, and it's really good, and do that. Um, you've got to help them make sure that they have the best product and that they have yeah. a product that's really desirable. Because once you have that, there's no barriers. And then you can talk about the fact that it's a woman-owned business, and you'll have an audience. So uh, just make sure that your women are really driving a great product through, the, uh, mm -hmm. through their system. And I think the concept of uh, competition, you know, this is, this is a safe space. I imagine we can say things that might be uncomfortable. Uh, we have to be careful about not buying just because you're a woman. I have to be careful about not buying just because it's a mm -hmm. person of color, because that's who I am. I expect it to be the best product at the best price. Um, and I think once to um, uh, your point here, Marty, once you do that, then a lot of times it's about communication, mm -hmm. uh, knowing who to buy from, knowing that you're making a difference. And there's numerous studies that say, you know, there's, there's a we, we do this trust barometer and we look at buying power, we look at how people make decisions. 54% of people now make a decision um, to buy or boycott based on how they feel or how they identify with an organization. And so when there's that mm. personal connect and I feel like I'm making a difference by buying from a woman, I will do that. And increasingly, you're seeing that. And if I don't feel that and if I don't respect the organization, I will not only not buy, I will boycott. Mm -hmm. And that's just not me. That is just generally speaking yeah. everything that we're seeing with consumer activists now. So it's the best time to do it. You've got the best product. You've got consumers who are expressing their values with their purchasing power. Mm -hmm. 
Who has the mic? Oh, someone have, yeah, go ahead. Hi. Okay. Introduce yourself. I'm Trisha DiGennaro, and I was a fellow in 99 to 2000. So thank you very much for all your help and the support of the fellowship. Um, thank to, thanks to all of you, because I think we've all been through probably everything you've talked about and simultaneously, and it's always ongoing. Um, I right now am in international security, and I work with the US military. And I think we all know what the state of the government is right now as far as women are concerned and how they're being, how, how, how that glass ceiling is actually coming back, probably. So as a non-traditional government person and somebody who likes to be nonpartisan, how do you, how would you start to transition in today's kind of environment and trying to get into government and policy making without being partisan and being a woman? <laughs> I mean, in international security, I, I'm with men every day. So, and there are very few of us. So you're so not with the government right now? Or? I'm a contractor. You're a contractor. Yeah, for you're DOD, I'm a DOD contractor with the U.S. Army. But it would seem to me that you know international security is such a, such a non-traditional role mm -hmm. for women. You would think it would mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. great mm -hmm. demand for yeah. uh, you know for, for uh, opportunities there. Hmm. Yeah. It's really hard because it, it's a man. It's a man's yeah. world, and yeah. I mean I don't think yeah. I sit in rooms all too often where I'm off, often the only woman and the only civilian. Mm -hmm. so, Do you have sponsors, someone that can Well, this is part of the problem because a lot of women won't, <laughs> won't sponsor, excuse me, <coughs> you're not the only one with the allergies. allergies. <laughs> a lot of women won't sponsor women in international security because there are very few women, first of all, and the women who are moved forward. So, mm. just something. Hi, everybody. I'm Liana Levitin from Atlanta, Georgia. We just celebrated 30 years of the formation of the um, IWF. And I, have, okay. I also have had the privilege, and I say this because I know so many of you that are here today, and we wouldn't be here if we didn't believe in IWF and the foundation, so we need to give more money to the foundation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I wanted to say one thing, that the influence, at least in my position as CEO of DeKalb County or other places, elected executive of a county that had 6,000 employees, I appreciate what you've said, but so many of you have helped with bottom lines. Marty Wickstrom at Nordstrom's, they didn't have one in Georgia. And we had a meeting, and I said, Marty, you need to come to our area. She was looking at Fulton County. And I said, no, you're going to come to the cab. And that is still one of its best stores. And Leanne and I did that together. We did it together. And see, I think that that's the point that no one ever does anything by themselves. That's true. It takes that's right. cooperation yeah. and working. Now, when I first got elected as a lowly county commissioner, the first woman in this <laughs> county, the, the Ku Klux Klan, and here as an immigrant woman, I was elected. Zoning, as most of you know, is very important. My first zoning hearing, the attorney gets up and talks about this wonderful project and says, gentlemen, I need your support. I said, and you don't need mine. Yeah. That got around and that never happened again. Yeah. So I want to say, Edelman worked with CDC, am I correct yes. with that? Yes. Ed with Bernie Marcus and all yes. those. And it's all exactly what you said, the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Whether it's in government, whether it's in private lives, right. Or, as Marty has said, making a success of a business. I got my inspiration from a Democratic woman, and she always had the saying, never give a boy a man's job, give it to a woman. <laughs> Can I say something? Uh, can I say something? Uh, can I just say something that keys off 
what you just said, sort of. Uh, I, I just think that not enough women support women in uh, who are running for office. Right. Right. There's, yeah. there's data that proves that, and that's part of our our problem. I think we need to somehow get over that hurdle. Well, we yeah. have a group now that is a bipartisan group that supports not only with words, but giving the money. It's the money. Yeah. It's the money. Yeah. It's the money. And we have money, at least yeah. a lot of us do. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, thank you. So my name is Anne Sachs. I'm a fellow from the 2013. Hi, Carol. Hey. Um, so very glad to be here. I'm in the tech industry, uh, very male oriented. I am uh, um, managing a, a portfolio of P&Ls, and I am a little bit worried. And, and I'm tagging on what you said. Hey, what we did is great, but it's not enough yet. It's it's still very few women, and the barriers now are subtle, right? So when you have a glass barrier, we, you can break the barrier now the barriers are much more complicated and subtle and even connecting that to the me too uh if you guys saw on the news today the intel ceo just got down mm -hmm. yes. um, because of it. he had a relationship with an employee um, so what i'm seeing or thinking is that the barriers are going to be kind of like okay you have two candidates and you're actually going to get the man because you don't want to get in trouble right because you don't want to you know maybe be seen one of the three c's that you may be clueless <laughs> maybe the person is clueless and then it doesn't want to put himself in a risk for that. So what can we do collectively to try to, to help with that issue of understanding what are the next barriers and how we can break them? Thank you. Mm. I, I mean, I, I, I think you just, I think we as women and we just who might be different from straight white men have to be extraordinary in everything that we do. And it's not fair, uh, but you have to just be extraordinary. And so if you have to choose between two candidates uh, and you're afraid, and, and I don't buy the, I don't understand sexual harassment. I just, I just don't buy it. <laughs> what don't you understand? <laughs> I mean, seriously, what don't you understand? And so, and we, and, and, and unfortunately, we talk about bottom line, it has become a significant moneymaker for me and my firm. Hmm. The volume of organizations that we are advising on, me too. And it's, you know, it's kind of icky money. Mm -hmm. It's kind of icky money, but it's, you know, it is what it is. Um, but I, I, I think, what did you say, don't take it? No, that's no, not going to happen. Take it. Take I, it. Yeah. I, I do. Well, you I said do. Green, green talks, <laughs> I do. Right? Well, because, of, because we also, by taking it, are teaching. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, yes, of course we're being paid for, but we also are teaching another generation of leaders about how to lead in a reasonable manner. Mm -hmm. um, to, to your question, I think you just have to be extraordinary. And I think all of us have to, you know, it's, it's all bottom line driven. Yeah. And you've got a candidate that you have to choose between. If, if the person believes that you can basically make more money for them, be more profitable for them, be more productive for them, and you're not chosen, you don't want to work there. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So it's yeah. either one or the other. Either they will see the value, and if they don't see the value, someone else will. And you simply don't want to be there. And, and to your point, I don't know if you recall early in this Me Too discussion, Mike Pence talked about um, maybe that the Senate should go back to rules probably from the 70s, maybe 80s, of women staffers not traveling with members. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so what does that mean to a woman's career? Yeah. It takes it. Yeah. It Not a good tanks idea. it. And so all of you are in positions of power. All of you have resources. Again, use your resources, use your voice to push back against that because that takes us so far back. Um, but, and, but there is something that we can do about it. I just don't buy that we can't do something about it. I actually think you can change anything. I think you can, too. And I think you, you have to be anything. pretty brave. I took a guy out that was a, I think he was a serial predator. And um, uh, I, he was a, uh, a CEO in a group. And I, I took him out. And I was not popular. Um, and people mm. said, you know, she's trying to change the culture. I said, look, there's millions of women out there. You do not need to date a woman in your firm. Mm -hmm. And you're putting, this needs to go to risk management. Right. And we need, right. this is, you're making money and corporations are losing money because this is a right. risk management. The very simple thing to say is stay away from the women in your company, treat them with respect, they'll treat you with respect, and that's the end of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love the 
I love the phrase, I took him out. <laughs> <laughs> I must say I'm a bit encouraged and concerned when I think about young women coming up. And we all assume, okay, we want to be leaders and the top jobs and have the kind of influence, but I see a lot of young women who are amazing and you know they're going to go way up but a lot of other young women who aren't interested. Yeah, they want awesome. something that they enjoy doing, whether they become a top position in the company or in whatever endeavor they're doing, that life balance is maybe very different than ours was or is. But there are differences in terms of the younger women culture and what they're aspiring to, and I'm not sure that we're A, addressing it, or B, whether we should be addressing it in terms of, oh no, you want to be leaders. So it's just a whole concern I have and whether we can address it in some intelligent way with amazing women who just don't want to get through the glass ceiling. And that's okay. And I, yeah, yeah, and that's, and that's, and that's, okay. that's, that's, what that's that's, what, That's okay. That was what equality yeah. was really all about. Ch chart your own path. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's Everybody the, doesn't have to be the same. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Choices, yeah. exactly. Right. Yeah. I have it's, a great friend the other day that said, Marty, why do you care if women get to the top of, of public companies? Why is that an issue with you? And I, she said, they're dropping out because they want to become entrepreneurs, and that's important. And, and that's, I said, yeah. okay. And I really respect that, and quite frankly, I respect what women want to do. But um, if we only have 5% women in CEO jobs, the power of corporations today is so massive and the amount of money yeah. that's being spent around the world and the consolidation of companies. 45% of corporations are made up of women, 55 men, and if we have no women at the top, decisions are being made for people in the world today, and not just in the United States, but in the world. Um, that are really driven by a male perspective. And that's mm -hmm. not okay with me. And I'm really finding between 45 and 50, 55, when we have a lot of strain, our kids are teenagers, we're worried about mm -hmm. uh, adult parents, all those mm -hmm. things, we gotta help some women through that and, and really help yeah. them go. Because, I mean, Bill Gates gets a planetary session at Davos, yeah. and, and, and he's the only one that's not, you know, not a head of state. Right. This is how powerful um, right. corporations are today, and we need women at the top of those corporations. And that's, that's the thing. And I, I, that's why programs like the Leadership Foundation's uh, Fellows Program is so critical, because we can easily populate boards. You know, women can yeah. be recycled, yeah. going from one to the other. Yeah. But we're not growing the pipeline. Right. And yeah. the women that want, it's about leveling the playing field. Mm -hmm. So if you want to stay what you're doing, that's fabulous. But if you want to move up, let's get rid of right. whatever is affecting the advancement so that you can move on. I think programs like, uh, like the Fellows Program yeah, are, are so yeah. pivotal to, right. to the they success are. of that. But a lot of it is attitude, just, just one, one story that Felice Schwartz gave, uh, Felice Schwartz, the founder of Catalyst. Catalyst. Yes. Mm -hmm. she, she wrote an article entitled, The Riddle of the Rings. The Riddle of the Rings. And she said she, was, uh, she went on a recruitment, uh, I think it was Columbia University, uh, and she found it interesting that the male graduates would put on a ring when they weren't married, and the women who were married would take, would take off, off the ring. Yes. <laughs> that is an example yes. of the ongoing attitude, no mm -hmm. biases that women are still facing. Maybe not as overt as it was back then, but clearly those types are very subtle. Type, well, she's not going to travel. Mm -hmm. My wife uh, mm -hmm. would be upset if I promote her, and then she travels with me. You know, there's all kinds of things that go into the decision-making process that are going to be so critical. So those subtle issues are still there. But I think that what we're talking about is let's level the playing field and yeah. let people rise yeah. as far and as yes. high. Yeah. Well, yes. and those of us who are on boards, I mean, how many times have I, somebody alluded to this, have I seen a woman get right up here yes. 
um, and there's some men up here who are in competition for the top job, and somehow they kill her off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think those of us who are on boards have got to yes. do more to mentor, to protect, so that they don't always kill them off. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, right I can count it. I, uh, we need I, I'm to, very we frustrated do. by that Bar whole Barbara, situation. Barbara, you're, you're absolutely right. We need strength in the boardroom, and we need strength yeah. and character in the boardroom. And, and, build the and to, to do yeah. that, mm -hmm. not absolutely. just to, to sit there and be yeah. the, uh, one of the women on the yeah. board, oh. but to, to look out for the, the women who are trying to get up there. Yeah. yeah. Karen, you would. Go ahead, is this, is oh. this on? Oh. Yes, Did thanks. you get screwed last time too? Also, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't consider it being screwed. That was a great question that you asked. Um, so I'm Karen Merrick, and I am a tech entrepreneur. I co-founded one company, took it public, then I became an angel investor, and now I serve on four public company boards, two in private equity, two real estate investment trusts. And I've started lots of things. I like to learn by doing. Uh, Lisa, I'm really interested in something that you said. You said that probably five or maybe more 10 years ago, you may not have been able to be in the leadership role that you are in now. And so I'd like for us to talk a little bit more about that, how we support women through the process, how we maybe we need better, uh, more enlightened uh, leadership uh, for the companies that we have, because I think this is part of the reason why more younger women don't want to go up because they can't figure out that, that way through. And I do believe that among women, there is some discrimination against women who throttle back. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, well, you're not, you, you, know, you didn't sacrifice 30 yeah, years like right. I did, <laughs> you know, and like that. And I think that this is something that we need to talk about as women. Mm -hmm. At least you've also changed a lot of the culture. Too. You've tried to. I have. I have. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I hope that that's my legacy that I have changed all the cultures that I've been in. I'm an agency person. I've, you know, besides my time in the Clinton administration, I've worked for all the major PR agencies. And I'm confident in saying that every agency that I have been to and has left uh, has more women and has more people of color in leadership positions. And that is, that's my personal responsibility to my industry. Um, I said that, Karen, in a meeting one time, and I didn't realize what an impact it had. Uh, I said it in a staff meeting, and I was uh, inundated by mostly women who said, what did you mean when you said that? And what mm -hmm. I meant was, uh, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, I had two teenagers, um, and I had a mother who, you know, for those who've known me, who had been my mentor, my muse, my everything. And I made a choice uh, to put my time and my attention there. And I have made a choice now uh, to put that time and attention here. But my career has not been, I probably could have gotten here faster, but um, I, I got here the way I was supposed to get here. Um, and I'm comfortable with how I got here. And. And also, this is God, I hope I don't hurt anyone's feelings and people are going to be disappointed in me and they're going to be like, I really liked her until she said this. And, uh, and, but I have to tell you, my job is not my life. Um, I have, um, I, on my, I, I talked about my legacy. My mother, before she died, said, you're the best daughter anyone could have ever asked for. My children think I hang the moon. They think I'm remarkable. Uh, so I, I was a great, great mother. I was a great daughter. I'm a solid wife. It's not, my, I'm, it's not you know, I, I give myself a solid, a solid B there. Uh, you know, I couldn't get all of them, but I have, I will celebrate my 30th wedding anniversary in November, though. Yay! And so, um, and I've had a really successful career. But it has come in stages. It's, there was a point where I That's could right. really focus here. There was right. a point where I could really focus here. But everywhere I have been, regardless of where I was, I did try to create this culture. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just in a position where I can mandate, to the degree that you can mandate anything, that culture. Yes. But yeah. I think, for me, it was in and out. It was in and out. But I'm here. I'm happy that I'm here. Um, I'll make as much of a difference as I can. But um, you know. I probably mentioned my son's getting married in two weeks, and that is the most important thing to me right now. 
period. Mm -hmm. And I'm comfortable with that. And I'm comfortable with the decisions that I've made. Yay. Yeah. That's what it's all about. That's the whole point. I, I, I also I, should I, say that Edelman yeah. is the second largest uh, uh, communications firm in the country, and our office is the most profitable. So I do need to there say that. Gotcha. It's all about making money. That. I just oh, wanted right. to add one more thing. When I became pregnant, um, I remember that I think Jim Nordstrom drew the, drew the short straw and came down and was wringing his hands, what are we going to do? You run our biggest business unit, blah, 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 what are we going to do? And I said, Jim, it'll be fine. He goes, yeah, do we pay you while you're gone? I go, you definitely pay me. You won't even know I'm gone. Yeah. And, um, but I, I think what I realized is there was so much pressure because I thought, boy, if I, if I mess this up, they won't give another woman a job like this in mm. two generations. So I put too much pressure on myself. Absolutely. But one thing I did think about is I'm never going to let this happen to a woman that works for me. So I would sit down and put a plan together and put a very detailed plan. But the other thing I did is I went to Spain and I met this incredible, go, go to Spain if you're wondering, send, send girls to Spain. But I sat down and all these women had all these kids and I was thinking, how can they run these businesses and have all these kids? How are they doing this? So I went to a woman's house and I sat down with her. She has six children and six extraordinary children and she's an extraordinary business person. And she said, Marty, make sure you're putting your priorities on the right things. Nobody cares in my family if I make uh, the cookies after school. And she said, I don't know where the spoons are in my kitchen, and I have not changed a bed since my first child was born because that's not where my value is. My value mm -hmm. is in the communication and the interpersonal relationship with my children. So we mm -hmm. sit for dinner every single night. She taught me a lot. It was very valuable information, mm -hmm. but anything I can do to, to give back. But I never let a woman go out on maternity leave without a plan. Yeah. 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 I think so, we have time for one more question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So first of all, I want to say to Lisa that um, I think your point about having a life is so important. So I was a, I'm Gail Graham. I was a 96, 97 fellow. Carrie was my mentor. Um, oh. And I went to her and I was supposed to say, I want to be CEO of a company, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but I was already a workaholic. And what I asked her was, what I really want to know is, is there a God and how do I stay married? Because <laughs> <laughs> I knew how to be a workaholic. That part was easy. But I wanted to speak for just a second about backlash around the Me Too movement. I'm a total, of course, feminist, and I believe in everything that we're trying to do to bring women's voices forward. But I have two sons who are great, and I have beaten them to be complete feminists themselves. <laughs> but one of my sons is at Goldman Sachs. And he has talked to me about what he sees in the backlash. And he said, Mom, mm -hmm. there are guys that believe there's a patriarchy, not just Steve Bannon. He was, he was only at Goldman Sachs for a moment, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but he said, there, he goes, fundamentally what the guys think is there is a patriarchy that's natural and somehow ordained. And mm -hmm. that when they do nice things for women, they deserve little chits in heaven. Mm -hmm. It's like they were sharing their toys. And mm -hmm. when the women complain, they're like, oh, those ungrateful bitches. And I said, really? Even today? And he's an investment banker, and he's like, yeah, mom. And he said, the other thing is, I am on the, you know, I'm on a team, but I'm the one who's always invited to go places with clients. And my, you know, Stanford, Harvard, you know, counterparts, these women mm -hmm. work their asses off. And that was, that makes me sad still. But I think that he's almost said to me that that there's behind those closed doors, an anger. That after all they've done for women, look what we've done back to them now. What an ungrateful set of females we are. So yeah. the work is still there for us. Yes. I think there is. Yeah. I think there is some pushback. I absolutely see that. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to say that um, back in the early 80s, Mayor Tom Bradley decided that he wanted a woman appointed to his business council. And going along with what Barbara was saying, and you were saying, Carrie, and you, Marcy, you know, it just, it's, it's a reflection of the past a little bit that a man of color appointed me to be mm -hmm. president of his business council. And we had everyone on it from ARCO that was in Los Angeles uh, to Bank of America, and uh, all of these operations were controlled by men. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was the only woman in the group. And so one day, a woman by the name of Karen Tumulty mm -hmm. called me. She wanted to know about the business council of the mayor. And she also wanted to know how it was to run this operation uh, with all these men. And she said, do you know anything about sex harassment? And I said, well, a little bit. I am a lawyer, and so I might be able to help out somewhere. And she said, well, I'd like to do a business article in the LA Times 
and I'd like you to address certain answers. And I said, I'd be very happy to. The article was labeled, Sex Harassment, a Costly Proposition to Business. Mm -hmm. And that's what I constantly harped on to the business leaders. If they don't step up, women on boards, as you're talking about, if they don't step up, the situation of power is never going to go away. And so, anyhow, keep up your yes. work, all of you. Well, that is a good note to end on. And I'm sure we can all uh, continue this conversation this evening. Um, I, in the notion of women supporting and learning from other women, I also want to let you know that Barbara has a terrific book available that she has there. It's not um, my, I didn't get, write this book. But, but it's on Amazon. It, yeah, it's the story it. of that, that story whole White of House chapter. Yeah, so you if can any of you are interested in ancient history, yeah. it's called <laughs> A Matter yeah. of Simple Justice, The Untold Story of Barbara Franklin and a Few Good Women. Yeah. And <laughs> thank you to this wonderful panel, and have a lovely evening. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Are good. That's great. Thank you, guys. Thank you.